Lens Kids started tonight. So we showed you a bunch of slides of a bunch of different things. Um, some things you thought were better than others, and you preferred some things over others. And for some of you guys, it was kind of, kind of a mix, and you weren't sure which one was right, and the room was kind of torn. You know, James tells us that um, when it comes to people, when it comes to people, that we shouldn't choose this over that. We shouldn't choose one over the other. Why? Shouldn't I surround myself with people that are going to make me happy, that are going to make me successful, with people that are encourage me, stimulate my thinking? Shouldn't I in surround myself with people that are going to help me in life? Um, you may have heard people say, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know, right? And they'll talk about, you know, how, you, you know, when it comes to getting a job or getting ahead in life, it really matters who you know, because if you know someone in a high place, they can really help you move to where you want to go. It's not about what you know, it's about who you know. And James says, nope, at least not in a certain sense. It's actually kind of backwards when it comes to the specific thing that James is going to talk about tonight. He would say that what you know in Christ should have a profound, when we say profound, we mean a deep or intense effect on how you treat people around you. So what you know in Christ should have a, a big, intense effect in how you treat people around you. So we're going to look at this. Turn to James chapter 2, and we're going to go 1 to 13 tonight. James chapter 2, 1 to 13, and James says this. He says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, well, you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Verse 5. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which He has promised to those who love Him? But if you have dishonored the poor man, but you have dishonored the poor man, He says, are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? And He goes on in verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and you're convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, and also said, do not murder, if... You do not commit adultery, but do murder. You become a transgressor of the law. So speak, so act, as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to, the, to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So James says, he starts out by saying, show no partiality. He says, don't play favorites. What was happening? What was going on in this church? Well, he gives us an example, right? He says a man with a gold ring and nice clothes comes in, and the people are like, oh, hey, how you doing? Come on in. And they, they lead this man to a certain seat, and they all huddle around him. They want to talk to him. They want to get to know him. They pat him on the back. Maybe if they're doing communion, you know, they, they bring the tray right over to him and, and give him the clean cup, you know. <laughs> They're like, give him the special treatment. And James says, but then a poor guy comes in. Someone who's got some shabby clothes on. Maybe a, little, maybe a little stinky. If it was King James Version, he stinketh, right? And uh, you, you see this guy and you're just like, oh, I don't know about that guy. I, uh, yeah, that guy, uh, he, he, we'll let another guy talk to that guy because I'm going with the gold guy and not that guy. And they were avoiding that person. And they were saying, hey, buddy, 
hey, hey, you who just come in, you go stand over there. Or you, got, you come in over here and you sit at my feet. Can you imagine? What's this guy getting treated like? A kid? A kid? What about a dog? I mean, who sits on the floor by your feet? I mean, some of you guys have little dogs that come up, then you have little purses and you carry them around, as you little strollers and you push them around the Irvine spectrum, right? This, this guy is, is lower than that. You come, you sit by my smelly feet. And remember back then, I mean, they weren't wearing shoes like we were wearing today. The, the sandals, remember Jesus washing the feet, this was a gross thing. You sit by my feet, that was a pretty insulting thing to say. And that's what was happening in this church treating some people kind of like dogs and other people like kings. And you might be saying, that's terrible. We would never do that. I would never take off you know, my shoes and stick them in some new person's face just because you know, they were kind of grossing me out. I wouldn't do that. But before we start casting judgment, before we start saying, man, that is, that is totally wrong, we got to think and we got to evaluate and we got to realize that we're constantly doing this kind of thing ourselves. And maybe we're not taking off our shoes and sticking them in the faces of others, but in, other, in some ways, it's kind of like that. We're constantly evaluating people, aren't we? We're, it's like we got Google Glass on, and we're walking around, and we got these little sensors, it's kind of like Iron Man, and they're zeroing in on people's heads, and we're like, you know, uh, hot, not so hot, nasty, uh, get away from me. You know, we've got, you know, and it's all popping over and we're constantly evaluating. We're evaluating people on all sorts of different things. We're looking at style. Are they up to date? They got the latest cool duds. Wait, duds? What do you say these days? Beats? <laughs> they got their beats on. You're looking fresh. You're looking hip. You're looking fly. It's pretty fly. <laughs> Are they, wearing the, are they wearing the latest fashion or are they wearing the homemade Ferrari shirt with the 70s shorts and the super high socks and the bottle cap glasses with their hair slicked over? Is, they, is that what they're looking like? We're evaluating. We're evaluating based on, on looks. Do they look like they could be on the cover of a magazine or, or do they look like they just climbed out of a dumpster? We're evaluating things like personality and we're, and we're thinking, are they outgoing? Are they quiet? Are they funny? Are they boring? Are they annoying? Are they awkward? And we're trying, making all these judgments. And we're, we're evaluating their, their opinions and their beliefs and the way that they think. I mean, does their thinking match up the way that I think? And, you know, can we have a, a good, pleasant, conversa stimulating conversation? Or am I going to get really annoyed by their beliefs and they're not the same as mine and, and, and therefore invalid and I don't want to have anything to do with them? To people like us, James asks a question in verse 4. He says this, Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And you might say, well, yeah, but everybody does, right? I mean, everybody makes these distinctions. And besides, you can't be friends with everyone you're not going to like everyone. There's some people that you know, let the, they, they're friends with other people for a reason. And we, we just, it's just not going to happen between me and them. Let someone else take care of them. Let's clarify something real quick here. Okay? Let's clarify this. James didn't say here, he doesn't say that you have to like everyone you meet. He doesn't say you have to like them. This, what he's talking about here when he says, show no partiality, he's saying this, or he's not saying this is about preference. We have, we have preferences, right? I mean, we throw up a bunch of different things on the screen, and it wasn't bad, necessarily, for you to like uh, Microsoft over Apple. Or it wasn't bad for you to look uh, like that, that nasty dog um, versus the really, really cute one. I mean, Katie McDonald the other day was texting me pictures of ugly dogs that are so ugly that she thinks they're cute. And that's her preference. I think it's wrong. <laughs> and I think she will be judged for that someday. <laughs> but that's her preference. James is saying, hey, this isn't about your preference. This is about your actions. Okay? This is about your actions. The problem isn't, is in the way you act towards others 
when you've determined that they uh, do or don't fit your preferences. We dislike someone or something, and so we avoid it, right? I mean, I don't prefer the pizza that's been setting out for three months, so I, I throw it in the trash, right? I prefer a car with wheels and an engine that runs over one that doesn't have an engine and has no wheels and just sits there and rusts, right? James is not saying that it's wrong to have preferences. He's trying to help us understand that when it comes to how we treat people, people whom God has created, there's a higher motivation that we need to have for the way we act. There's a higher motivation. There are reasons to put our preferences aside and treat both the ones that we prefer and the ones that we may not prefer equally. And that's what we want to talk about tonight. We want to throw down four reasons real quickly that there may be one or two more in here, but these ones I thought really pertain to us, and we're going to pull them out tonight. Here are the reasons. Um, reasons for not showing partiality. Reasons for putting your preferences aside and treating people equally. And here it goes. First one, because God chooses the poor. God chooses the poor. Those who realize that they have nothing to offer are the ones who end up trusting God and relying on Him. Look at James chapter 2, verse 5. He said, Listen, my beloved brothers. Now when, when, when James or someone, anyone in, in, in writing says listen, it's kind of like, <laughs> right? It's like, wake up! Listen! Listen, brothers! He says, Has not God chosen those who are poor? in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he's promised to those who love him. This is what Jesus was talking about in that, in that Sermon on the Mount when he was saying, blessed this and blessed that. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the ones who are realizing that, that they are needy, that they are sinful people, that they can't save themselves, they, they need to find a solution to fix this problem. Those are the people that, that Jesus came for. He died on the cross for them. There are plenty of rich people, rich in, in possessions, but also rich in their egos, thinking that they've got it all together, that will never place their trust in the cross of Christ. Why would they? They've got it all together. But the poor people, they hear the good news of the cross, and they're like, man, I've been trying to find a solution. I realize that I'm a sinful person. I realize there's, there's some kind of a disconnect between me and God. Wait a second. This is the answer I've been waiting for. I'm ready. The ones who are, are, are poor or sick are the ones who tend to, to go to the hospital and get help in the same way. Those who are sinful, those who realize, I don't have anything to offer you, God. I can't save myself. Those are the ones that come to the Lord and say, I, I trust in Jesus and what He did. And they, they're the ones that get forgiveness. And Jesus said, these are the ones, the poor in spirit, they're getting the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, they might be dirt poor here on this earth. They might have nothing. They might have no real huge future. They're not going to get a house in Nelly Gale. They're not going to get the Ferrari. They're not going to get maybe the, the hottest boyfriend or girlfriend. They might not even have a, a, ever get in a relationship at all. They might be completely bankrupt. But I want to tell you something. Those guys are going to be rich. And that guy who comes in and might be just filthy, smelly, un, you know, unattractive personality, awkward, sits by himself, um, doesn't know how to talk to anybody. That person is a person that God wants us to reach out to because God loves that person. God chooses the poor. He chooses the poor. He said, listen, my br beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith? and heirs of the kingdom. So if it's the poor that God reaches out to, the poor in spirit, then why are we pushing them away? Why are we pushing them away? That's the first one. God chooses the poor. The second one is this. Why put aside your preferences? Because 
you don't want to be like that. That's the best point I could come up with. You don't want to be like that. James says that instead of helping people, you're acting like the rich people who are trying to push you down. Do you realize that? He gives them kind of a, hello, McFly, are you there? Do you realize what you're doing here? Listen to verse uh, 6. He says, but you've dishonored the poor. Are not the rich ones who oppress you, the ones who drag you into court? He says, guys, a rich person comes into your church, sits down, and then, you know, he's talking about rich in, in monetary rich. They have the gold ring, the fancy clothes, and everyone huddles around him. Oh, yes, we got a rich person. Because you're thinking, oh, man, maybe I can benefit from this. And he says, the rich people are the ones who are giving you constantly, you Christians, giving you a hard time. And yet you're trying to cuddle up to them. <laughs> you're snuggling. Come over here. Get in my Snuggie. And that's what happened in the story of the great Gatsby, right? Jay Gatsby, man, he wants what the rich people have, and he wants to be, what does he want? He wants to be loved. He wants to be loved by that one special girl. What's her name? Daisy. He wants to be loved by Daisy. Daisy's one of the rich, and so he goes off to war. He comes back. He realizes that she married someone else. He wants to win her back. So what does he do? He, he makes as much money as he possibly can, and he does it in ways that... Summer ways are good. A lot of ways are kind of bad. And um, it doesn't matter, though, to him. He just wants to, he wants to win her back. And so he throws these huge parties, right? Massive parties. And people come from all around. They don't even get invitations. They just show up because they want to, to experience all the stuff that he has there. The music and the dancing and the pools and the, whatever else there is there. And yet... If you've seen the movie, if you've read the book, you remember when, when Gatsby dies? How many of those rich people show up? None! No one shows up at his funeral. Not even the one he loved. Not even the one he did it all for. It's kind of like that. James is saying, why would you want to be like that? Why would you want to be like one of these people? Why do you care so much you're going to show partiality to these people who are, are throwing down on you all the time and are making your life miserable and maybe will we'll, we'll come alongside you and be like a, a good time friend, but when things start to go bad, they're gone. He goes on to write this in, in verse 7. Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? He says... These are the people that mock the name of Jesus in whom you find your life. You placed your trust in Jesus. You say you're all about Him. You say what He did on the cross, that's what makes the real difference in your life. That was the greatest gift you could ever have. And then you want to get buddy-buddy. You want to get chummy with these rich people. Why would you want to turn around and be like them? It's kind of like an, an, a kid who was an orphan. An orphan kid taken in and cared for by, by, by an old guy. And he takes this little orphan kid and he says, you know what, I, I've never had any kids of my own and I'm going to raise you and I'll clean you up. And he, and he, and he gets the guy, the, the kid all clean and takes all the lice out of his hair and gives him great clothes and, and, and good food and, and puts him in a great school. And the kid grows up and he grows and grows. But then after several years, um, and the old man loses his, his sight, the boy um, joins in with some friends in making fun of the old man. And says, uh, yeah, 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 that guy is, look at him trip, look at him fall, oh yeah, yeah, that is pretty funny, guys. He cares more about the approval of his friends than the one who rescued him. James says, don't be like that. Why do you want to be like that? You don't want to be like that. Third reason. Put aside your preferences because God calls you to love your neighbor. He calls you to love your neighbor. Look at verse 8. If you really fulfill, fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the law. He says, you're doing well if you really do it. But... If you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. 
when it comes to caring about others around you, um, you're not even supposed to show partiality to yourself. Have you ever thought about that? If you think about the, the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, that means you aren't to be partial about yourself. You aren't to say, oh, me first, me first, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest. Instead, you're looking around you and you're saying, it's an even playing field. And well, I experience pain and I experience hunger and I experience, have all these different desires, I care about that person equally. And I'm not going to put my desires before them. I mean, this happened all the time in, in my house growing up. With eight kids in the house, when it came time to order pizza, and mom doesn't make any sense, but she orders two mediums for eight hungry kids, and you put those things on the table, you are eyeing every single piece, and you are counting pepperonis, you are counting sausage. You were looking at, does the cheese go to the end of the crust? Is some spilling over in different places? Is one piece a little bit bigger than the other? And you want the biggest piece with the most stuff on it because you know you may only get one. And you know what happened? We'd start eating, right? And everyone starts to eat their pizza all at the same time. And we're looking to see who's going faster than the others because there's only like two pieces left in the box, right? And you want to make sure that you're one bite ahead of everybody else so that you can grab that next piece before they do, right? He says, love your neighbors yourself, guys. Don't show partiality even to yourself. You've heard of that golden rule? A lot of people think it's in the Bible. <laughs> it's not. But it, but it has biblical principles. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's kind of the idea. When you look at others, you should be putting yourself in their shoes. And you're thinking... How would I want to be treated if I were them? Do you ever think about that? I mean, let's just get real practical and talk about our group here. Someone walks in, someone's new. Do you ever, do you ever look at that new person and they, they're standing there. Maybe they, they kind of sidle up to the wall, you know, because they don't know where to go. And then awkwardly they bump the light and turn out the lights and then they're embarrassed and they <laughs> walk away. <laughs> happens all the time, right? Man, are, are we thinking like, I wonder what it's like to be them. And how can I treat them the way I would want to be treated if I just did something embarrassing for a new person to do? I like what, what Warren Wiersbe writes. He says this. He takes it even further. He said, Christian love means treating others not the way I want to be treated. He says, the way God has treated me. Christian love means treating others the way God has treated me. And in case you think it's okay to let this, this law, the love your neighbor as yourself thing, go by the wayside, you're going to obey all the other laws, but you know what? I just don't feel like it. I'm an introvert. I'm not one of those people who likes to get out of myself and go up and greet other people and reach out to other people. I want people to come to me. If you think that you are the exception and you're going to make an exception of this law, you need to think again. You need to think again. Check out what James writes next. In uh, verse 10, he says, For whoever keeps the whole law, but fails in one point, one point, one tiny little aspect of the law, has become accountable for all of it. Another trans translation says, um, he's guilty of all. You offend the law in one point. You break the law in one point, you're guilty of all of it, James writes. And then he goes on, he says, For he who said, I do not commit adultery, which is one of the Ten Commandments, also said, I do not murder. So, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. He said, so, so you say, love your, I, I, uh, I don't murder people, um, I don't commit adultery, but in God's law is also that love your neighbor as yourself. And if you start saying, well, I don't do this and I don't do that, but then that love your neighbor as yourself thing, yeah, yeah I, I kind of compromise on that. He says, you're a lawbreaker. Right? 
It only takes one sin to make you a sinner. And I think that's one thing that, that down here in Orange County we really struggle with. Uh, our pastor on, on Sunday talked about white lies and how we kind of justify things and we say, well, it's just a little white lie. And we do that all the time and we think, well, you know, it's just, just a little this, just a little that. And people all over the place think, well, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good compared to so-and-so or so-and-so or him or her. I'm pretty good. God looks at me and he's got these big cosmic scales up there. And as long as my good outweighs my bad, I'm, I'm doing well. And, you know, I'll come to God and he'll put my good deeds on one end and my bad deeds on the other. And tips, all right, go on into heaven. It's not the way it works. Not the way it works. He said, he said in verse 12, so speak and so act. He says, you say it, you say this is who you are, then act it. Be a person of integrity that's the same in and out. So speak, so act, as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, now real quick, Jesus promised that if you are a Christian, if you placed your trust in Him, there's not going to be, you're not going to be judged for your sins. You're not going to be judged. You know why? Christ was judged for your sins on that cross. Paul said, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No one's going to come condemning you. You don't have to be afraid. If you place your trust, this is the beauty of the cross. You place your trust in Christ. You realize, I, I've messed up in life. I've done some things. Maybe not some hor- not terrible, terrible things, but I have messed up here and there. I'm guilty of the whole law. I need what Jesus did, so I place my trust in Him. And you die. A, car, a huge, horrible car accident over on La Paz on the way home. And you're gone. You're done. You're toast. Your car, I mean, it just looks like a pancake, and your brain is all over. Um, and you're standing before God. You're standing before God, and you're thinking, oh, man, and I did do some things. Oh man, I don't know if the scales would tip in my favor. And God looks at you and He sees, this is a person who is, has the mark of Christ on them. They have trusted in Christ. Get in there. Get on in there. Come on, let's go. You're like, wait a second, but I look at those lists of sins here. And God says, no, no, no. We're ripping that up. Get in there. All I see when I look at you is Jesus. That's awesome. Jesus said you're not going to be judged. So what's this about? What's James saying about judgment here? What's he saying? Speak, so speak, so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. We don't have to fear that God's going to judge us when we fail to measure up because of what Jesus did. But the Bible tells us that we are going to be judged and rewarded for the things we do. For the things we do. Look at, uh, listen to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9. We're just about to wrap up here. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. He says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All of us are going to appear before the seat so that each one of you may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So there is an aspect of God's going to God's going to reward some people for what they've done. One last thing. It's actually the first thing that James mentions here. You should not show partiality because you have faith in Christ. Because you trust in Jesus and find your identity in him. That's why you shouldn't show partiality. He says, "My brothers, verse 1, Show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Let me just help this make sense in your minds real quick. By pointing to their faith, James was basically saying, he says, hey, you guys, you placed your trust in Christ, right? Because you realized you can't save yourself. You've tried to be good enough on your own. You can't. So... You've been trusting in Christ's righteousness. Christ lived a perfect life, and that's now applied to you. You've been trusting in that, and you've been identifying with that. 
you said that Christ is now your, your new life. So, if you're saying that Christ's righteousness, his, his goodness, right, his perfect life, is what you need, then maybe, now that he saved you and empowered you to do good, maybe you should try to pattern that in your own life. You say, Christ's righteousness is what I need? Then maybe your life should start looking a little bit like Jesus. You don't say, Christ's righteousness is what I need, uh, and now I'm going to do all kinds of terrible things in life, right? Um, you don't say that, um, you know, I need uh, an Apple computer, and, the, and then go get a Casio calculator watch, right? It's just, it just doesn't make sense, right? Do you even know what that is? Yes. Some of you do. Good, good. You're learning. You're teachable. How did Jesus treat people? If you should be like Jesus, how did Jesus treat people? He didn't look at the outward appearance. He looked at the heart. Matthew twenty-two sixteen. People who didn't like Jesus said this, You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. And the Bible tells us that Jesus, you, you know, he didn't, was no respecter of persons. He didn't value anyone higher than the other. But the Bible also tells us that he himself wasn't much to look at. He wasn't much to look at. In Isaiah 53, it says, He had no form, of ma- or no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. I wonder if Jesus walked into this room, would we get, want to get close to him? Or would he be the guy that we're just like, ah, he's weirding me out. I don't want to be next to that awkward freak over there. If Jesus walked in the room, would we welcome him with open arms? Or would we avoid him because he's not in our preference profile? He doesn't fit. Before we think we would jump at him, we need to remember one last thing. Jesus reminds his disciples, he tells them, that whenever they encounter someone in need, they should think of that person as if it was Jesus himself. In Matthew 25, 37, um, people come to God saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it for me. You and I have opportunities to serve Jesus every day. We come into contact with all kinds of people. Some who fit our preference profile and others who are the exact opposite of it. And Jesus says, Whenever you've done something to the least for the least of these, realize this, you're doing it for me because I love them. Go ahead and close your eyes and, and bow your heads and, and let me just ask you a couple questions. How are you treating others around you? Are there people that you're treating better, better than others? Or there's some people that you're just intentionally treating poorly. If you've placed your trust in Jesus, it's time to put your preferences aside and to treat both the ones that you prefer and the ones that you may not prefer the way that God treated you. Let's pray. Lord, we we thank you We thank you for for loving us because we know that we weren't desirable. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, that's when Christ died for us. Lord, we we thank you for showing us how this all works and for showing us what it means to love the unlovable. We have been loved and we thank you for that, Lord. Please help us to model that to others that we would put aside our preferences and the things that, that tend to repulse us and that, that put us off, and we would, we would treat them with your kind of love. 
Lord, there may be some in this room who haven't experienced that love and they, and they, and they don't know what it means to be loved by you and, and maybe they haven't even thought about the fact that, that they really have broken the whole law by just breaking one little point and, and maybe they haven't realized or don't even know that the wages of sin is death and that, that they're going to be eternally separated from you because of even the small things, the, the things that they think have been small, but those things have been separating them from you. And Lord, if there are some in this room tonight who are, who are at that point where they're realizing, yeah, I, I, I need something. I need, I need a fix. I need, I need a solution to this problem in my life. Lord, I pray that they would place their trust, simply place their trust in what Christ did on the cross and understand that Jesus came and died in their place so that their sins might be forgiven. Might they trust in Him and give their lives to Him. Say, Lord, I am Yours. Thank You for saving me. Lord, we love You. We thank You for this, this time that we've had in Your Word. And we pray that You would you just minister to us as we go into our discipleship groups. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.